Reunion with Luigi. <sighs> Who'd want to do that? Huh. Oh, look at that. A lame setup for a skit idea. It's a Mario crown! That's kind of cool. Well, a princess crown, technically. Let's, uh, take a look. Let's see how it looks, huh? What do you think? <laughs> Does somebody want to tell me what's going on here? Daisy! Thank goodness I found you! I'm not Daisy. Well, you look like Daisy. You smell like Daisy. Let me see if you taste like Daisy. Okay, that's... far enough. Oh, sorry. I didn't have my glasses on. I didn't see the lame plot set up for a skit. Anyways, you've got to help Princess Peach. Mario's been... Wait a minute. I don't got to do anything for Peach. When's the last time I was in my own game? Princess Daisy's history is an interesting tale, to say the least. Created by the late Gunpei Yokoi, Daisy's role was similar to that of Princess Toadstool from the early Mario games, in that she was a damsel in distress. Her first role was in Super Mario Land, where Mario was transported to her kingdom called Sarasaland. When I was a kid, I always called it Sarasara Land. This literally adds nothing to the review other than to prove I was an idiot as a kid. Yeah, only an idiot would dress up as Princess Daisy in a YouTube video game review series. Anyways, after Mario rescued Princess Daisy from the evil space villain Tatanga, she's mostly been banished to the various sports and party games that come out. Yep, that's Daisy's history in a nutshell. What a jip. You'd think that after 30 years they'd put me as the heroine in a game. I was even in the Super Mario Brothers movie for crying out loud. They did you dirty. Right? I'd like to do you dirty. Stop. There are children watching. Nobody's letting their kids watch your horrendous show. That's... probably accurate. Then Rosalina showed up in 2007's Super Mario Galaxy for the Nintendo Wii. Having a larger role and backstory than Daisy, Nintendo began to prop the second blonde princess up on a higher pedestal than Daisy could ever reach, featuring her in not one, but two mainline Mario games, and as an unlockable character in Mario 3D World. As a kid, I always wondered, why weren't there any Mario games with the princess in the lead role? Well, during the DS era, we got an answer to that exact question. Super Princess Peach was released for the Nintendo DS in 2005. At the time, it was the only game where you only play as a princess and a platformer for the entire time, aside from if you only pick her in Super Mario Bros. 2. The game is really fun, but got criticism regarding the emotions-based power-up system. Touch the screen and you can trigger different emotions that can help unlock new areas or defeat enemies. It's one of my favorite DS games, despite it being a bit easy. So, why was Daisy cut out of the role of Damsel, or for that matter, why hasn't she starred in her own game as a heroine? Why wasn't she included in Super Princess Peach? Why has she been relegated to sports and party games? Was it because of the personality she'd been given as a sassy tomboy? Some fans placed the blame on Shigeru Miyamoto, and there's been rumors that disagreements between Gunpei Yokoi and Miyamoto contributed to Daisy's disappearance in main games after Yokoi left Nintendo. He sadly passed away from a car accident back on October 4th, 1997. Is there any truth to this? I suppose only Miyamoto knows for sure. Honestly, he just doesn't like the color orange. Who doesn't like the color orange, eh? Oh, I didn't realize this was a color review show. Stick to video games, princess. Today we're going to take a look at fans' efforts to not only involve Daisy more, but also the princesses in general. The Mario fan game scene is tremendous, with dozens of games available on both the Super Nintendo and NES. I've handpicked three games that I'll be spotlighting today in light of Nintendo's shortcomings. 
Can fans do a better job than Nintendo? Let's find out. First up, The Three Little Princesses, created by Batata Douse and Orange Bronze Daisy. The version I'm taking a look at is version 1.3, released January 2022. It was originally released under the name Super Princess Daisy The Plumber's Rescue, but when Batata Douse came on board, the concept was updated and the name was changed. This is actually based on a fan comic done by Canadian artist Yves Borgelas of the same name. We open to a warning about the game containing memes and references that might not be suitable for everyone. Looks like you need to leave, Toad. This is way too inappropriate for you. Girl, please. The other day I snorted Toad's through a dust off Toadette's blades. I think I'll be okay. That was information I didn't need to know. Next at the title screen, we see Goombella chilling with the three princesses, Daisy, Peach, and Rosalina. Nice to see some Paper Mario throwbacks here. The story is told in front of a black background where Peach and Daisy go to Mario and Luigi's mushroom-shaped house only to find a note at the door. We're on vacation right now, so don't bother us. Go away. Signed, Mario and Green Mario. <laughs> Daisy points out there's no way they wrote this because they never write notes or letters. Hmm. I guess the fact that Luigi calls himself Green Mario wasn't a clear enough giveaway. Rosalina shows up saying her kingdom has been taken over and the ladies go back to the castle to uh, debate about what is happening. There's nothing wrong with three ladies getting together to talk about a crisis. I'm having a crisis in my pants just thinking about it. That's it. She touched me! Wow! We come to find out that uh, whoever these characters are took over her kingdom. Three random women who are probably from some anime that I'm not familiar with. It seems like a lot of influences were taken from other sources in many ways, which we'll dive into a bit, but to summarize up the story, the brothers are missing, possibly kidnapped by these three women, and it's apparently Daisy's duty to lead the three princesses to find them and save Rosalina's kingdom because she's apparently the strongest. you damn right! That's not muscle. You look like you ate the other two princesses. How dare you! I am the princess of Sarasaland. You will show me respect! Don't you mean Sarah Sarah Land? Listen, honey, I'm not judging. I'm just saying I like a little cushion with my pushin. Ugh, gross. Let's move on. Good. I'm tired of these skits ruining this review. Who likes this stuff anyways? I'm really impressed with the graphics here. Pressing start on the main map, we can move across the kingdom to show a really detailed land. Currently in this game, there's 21 levels playable, and the controls are nice and tight, mapped to the standard Super Mario World style with B as your jump button, A as your spin jump, and Y as your run and action button. There's different power-ups you can get, but unlike most Mario games where your character has a smaller version, Daisy never shrinks in size. Instead, she can collect mushrooms, which give hard Hearts. Get hit and you lose a heart. Lose all your hearts or jump into a pit or spikes and it's a lost life. What I don't understand is why a fire flower doesn't give me a heart back. Instead it just gives you firepower. But a 1-up gives you your health back fully. Huh? This is kind of like giving Sonic a health bar when he picks up rings. It just feels unnatural to what we've all been accustomed to over the years. If I have fire flower power, I shouldn't be dying from one hit. Part of this was most likely done to avoid figuring out how to shrink the princesses or to save on new sprite creations. When you lose all your lives, you get a game over, but what's great is that you can continue where you left off, both on the map and from the last checkpoint. Instead of a flagpole, you have to collect a crown at the end of the level to move on, but its placement just feels really hollow in the game. Power-ups in this game are really a string of good ideas, poorly implemented. Making the feather into a two-part power-up is intriguing, but the first part allows you to dash, and if you hold the Y button, you can hover, which really should have been default in my opinion. That's kind of the princess go-to move ever since Super Mario Bros. 2, but half the times this dash attack ends up killing me instead. Rosalina's wand acts like a fire flower, and Peach gets this, I don't know, almost useless melee umbrella. All the girls get to press A to do the stomp ability from Mario World, but I feel like if they just kept the rest of the power-ups like Mario World, this would have been a much better game to play. The innovation of these new moves just seems very poorly implemented. 
the other two princesses follow you around and repeat what you do, which is a visually impressive look, however, it can be a bit distracting in some of the more colorful, detailed levels. You can play as the other princesses in certain levels that allow you to only play as one at a time, for example, the train level in World 2. Colors are extremely vibrant here, with the map giving the world a more polished look than the standard Mario Overworld map. Everything is impressively detailed on the map, from the little animations of things in the background to the less cartoony shading and coloring. The in-game sprites for the princesses look great, but some of the other characters introduced don't exactly look like they fit in the game, but more on this in a bit. To elaborate on the power-ups, they really are a mixed bag. The Fire Flower is clutch for Daisy, and the Wand attack for Rosalina is pretty much the same. There's a Feather which allows you to hover with the Y button, but it's also used as a Thrust attack, which I found has varied results. I feel like the Thrust attack should have been a different button, like the R button, leaving the Hovering designated only to the Y button. Though, once you reach Deep Dunes 3, you can manually switch princesses using the L or R button on the world map. What's odd though is if you switch to Rosalina or Peach, Daisy completely disappears. Not sure why, but maybe it's just incomplete. This would get in the way of that control scheme. Still, I think that there should have been a better option. Musically, this game is ridiculous. It utilizes Super NES tracks from a variety of games, including reworked songs from Castlevania games, Mega Man X, DuckTales, Donkey Kong Country, and more. However, some of the songs that did debut on the Super NES were tweaked to make them sound less like their originals, which I guess makes sense? After all, Capcom, Konami, and Nintendo all used different styles of sampling, but still, it is a bizarre feeling playing this game. Throughout the game, you'll come across characters that I, I simply don't recognize. Are these from other games or anime? I have no idea. You'll need to help out these randos with whatever tasks they give you. Like, is this some kind of Winx Club stuff? I don't know, I have no clue. I like the idea of expanding the story in between worlds or levels, but I don't think it works here as the characters simply do not fit within the Mario universe. Couldn't they have just used Mario characters? Is that Lady Dimitrescu from Resident Evil Village? Adam's family references and backgrounds from the Super NES game? And Five Nights at Freddy's? 4chan gets a mention? And like, what are these enemies later in the game? Why are all the designs changing for stuff like coins? What is going on in this insane fever dream of a game? Seems like they went a bit overkill with the random fandom references. It just makes the whole game seem really cheap and corny. This leads me to the next game, another Super Mario Bros. hack. This one's called Super Mario Bros. Daisy's Kidnapping. Bondage, huh? I'm in. 2019's Super Mario Daisy's Kidnapping was created by Tahixem. There were plans to revamp the game and call it Super Mario Stellar Rescue, but it seems that work has stalled since 2021. The basic plot of this one involves Mario and Luigi leaving their, eh, kind of empty, bland home. Seriously, all they have is bookshelves? Anyways, they're headed to the castle for an afternoon tea session with Princesses Peach and Daisy. Suddenly, Daisy goes missing along with the Power Stars, and it's up to Mario to find both and stop Bowser. We never get to see Bowser show up and do this, and Daisy never really goes missing visually. It's only told to us by Luigi. I kind of would have liked to see a cutscene or something where they show this. Unlike other early Mario games, this one has more in common with Super Mario 64 in terms of the way you enter each world. Hidden within the castle doors are various paintings. Jump into them and you'll enter your destination. The game has more of an open world vibe in terms of outside the castle. You can go to the Toad Village, talk to a variety of toads, and find a ship with the Power Stars on it. I assume once you collect all the Power Stars, this ship will take you to a new part of the game, but since this one is still a work in progress, I guess we can't say for sure. Anyways, there's a total of 32 levels with each world having a mini-boss castle and final castle where you'll face off against one of the Koopa Kids. This game is absolutely gorgeous. It's a combination of Super Mario World and the Mario All-Stars game, and honestly, aside from some of the more open-worldy aspects, it could perfectly fit in as a prequel to Mario World. There are some parts of it I find kind of frustrating though, such as a lack of mushroom houses. You can't collect anything on the map that allows you to use 
use power-ups before you enter into a level. So there's a clear inspiration from the original Super Mario Brothers, where each level is its own battleground, with only the power-up you leave with carrying over. It's not bad, it's just not maintaining with the evolution of the series. It's like when they took the slide out of Mega Man 9 and 10. Yeah, I know, I'm still complaining about that. Carry on. I didn't realize this was a Mega Man review. Speaking of the power-ups, there's a really solid mix of old classics and some newer ones with originals thrown in too. The standard raccoon and fire flower power-ups are joined by the Hammer Brothers boomerang, frog suit, ice ball, and more. One of the more unique power-ups was the bubble coin one, which allows you to turn enemies into coins hidden in bubbles. However, it arcs upwards when fired. This makes sense, but it still took some time to get used to. All the music in the game is either pulled from Mario All-Stars, Mario World, or are redone tracks from newer games arranged in the Super NES style. It's all really awesome, and some of the best fan game tunes I've ever heard. But I'm not sure if any of the tracks are originals, as I don't know every single Mario song, but the stuff that's heard all sounds like it came from a Mario game, so the creator definitely gets props for making the game sound in tune with the franchise. Although there's one song that sounded a bit odd to me. Is that the Nationwide jingle? Nationwide is on your side. Thankfully, there's a move that slightly helps with recovery when falling down a hole, and that's the wall jump move. Pressing against a wall, you can press the jump button and push off of it to hopefully get back to higher ground. It doesn't always work, but it's still a lifesaver, both out of the pits and if you're looking to gain access to harder to reach locations. Similar to the previous game we discussed, Daisy's Kidnapping lets you continue from the level you couldn't be if you get a game over. I like that fan games like this can recognize that the older games were more difficult because they made you redo what you've already finished as a punishment for dying too much and getting a game over. Personally, I think this is a more user-friendly way of doing continues, and it made me want to actually see the game through to the end, or at least as far as I could have gone. I feel like if the game made me replay the older levels that I had already finished, I probably wouldn't have continued. My biggest complaint with this game is regarding the decision to add a ground pound. Now I don't have an issue with them actually adding the ground pound, but the way they did it really doesn't work. Pressing down while in midair, Mario will do a ground pound, and more often than not, this was the direct cause of my deaths throughout my playthrough. You have to be extremely conscious while running in this game, because one wrong press while in the heat of action will risk sending you to your doom. If this was mapped to the R button, it would have been a much better idea. Controls should never drive up the difficulty level in a game. I really enjoyed my time with Super Mario Daisy's Kidnapping. The problem is, the Sky World's difficulty feels unbalanced at points to the rest of the game, and there's no ending. After I beat what I presume is Iggy Koopa with glasses on, we're given an end screen with no sign of Daisy in sight. I've been checking back with the thread to see what happened to the game, but it appears the plot will remain the same. However, it seems that it's been completely overhauled. Sadly, this build has not been presented in any downloadable form, with only screenshots visible from the Super Mario World Central forums. Here's hoping the developers can finish this one, because it's a blast to play. If they can tighten up the controls, fix the font a little bit, and clean up the overworld graphics, I'd argue that this could have been a legit Nintendo release. Color me impressed. Now it's time to move on to our final game, and I've saved the hardest for last. Peach and Daisy, the ultimate quest for the NES. Oh boy, you're in for it now. I couldn't find much information on the web about Peach and Daisy The Ultimate Quest, but I've known about the game for at least four to five years. This is a hack of Super Mario Bros. 3 on the NES. You'll be taking on the role of either Peach or Daisy, depending on if you choose one or two players. However, despite Daisy just being a palette swap here, the rest of the game's assets are quite impressive. This looks and plays like a proper Mario sequel. Some of the power-ups added really make sense. The frog suit has been converted into a mermaid suit, fire flowers, and the leaf still do exactly what you'd expect them to. Also, unlike the three princesses hack, this one does shrink the princesses down to a smaller size when attacked. Honestly, when playing through this game, aside from the odd font styles for certain parts, I thought this was genuinely a well-done ROM hack. Graphics are mostly on par with Super Mario Bros. 3, and unlike the other games, features all the same music from the classic sequel. No originals. But all that changed after advancing just a few levels. This game is 
insanely hard, like Kaizo Mario hack hard. And the developer added in things just to mess with people. This is for sure a game that requires playing through it via save states because you will die over and over and over again. I gotta say, my feelings can't be encapsulated better about this one than this clip right here. I accidentally left my mic on and my feelings could not be more genuine. They set up a death spot right after you finish the level, forcing you to reapproach how you touch the goal box. You son of a! You son of a! Sadly, I wasn't able to pass World 2 because the ROM's release has a bug in it that was never fixed. I did find out afterwards that there's a way to advance past it by using a Game Genie plugin, but man, I just don't have the patience for this game. You know. When you stop to think about this game, it really draws parallels to the actuality of being a woman. Think about it. All day, every day, your life is just batting away cheap, cheap internet dongs, having to deal with the Hammer Brothers patriarchy, a bunch of fat, green, hammer-throwing men throwing their stupid tools at you, having to deal with the fact that the brothers have it easier than you do. When's the last time in an official Mario game that wasn't Mario Maker that this kind of garbage existed? Just making life harder for the working princesses of the world. You got all that just by putting on a dress and some makeup? Wow, you really are virtue signaling here. Stuff a cork in it, shroom. I'm done dealing with men. And I'm certainly done dealing with you. In all seriousness, let's talk about the real problems in this video. Like the fact that Daisy wasn't in the new Super Mario Strikers game as a default character. What were you thinking, Nintendo? I mean, come on, I need some sass up in that a You know what? I'm done. I'm just gonna go get a makeover. Thanks to all Patreon supporters, but especially the Morningstar Whip tier and up. They are Sam Schaefer, The Eighth Sign, Scott McElhone, Venthros, Great White North Presents, Nintendo, Bryce, Derek Demitter, and Trevin Adams. Your continued support helps fund reviews like this one, which would simply not be possible without the donations from Patreon members. I appreciate each and every one of you for continuing to help me make the content that you want to see. Classic, goofy YouTube video game reviews. If anyone is interested, just a dollar down gets you access to exclusive streams on Discord, stretch goals like Taco Bell food reviews each month, along with director's cut commentary for episodes, a free sticker, regular updates on upcoming reviews, and more. Check it out at patreon.com forward slash dongle. I hate to sound like a typical YouTuber, but if Patreon's not your thing, but you still want to help get the word out, share this video on social media. Exposure really helps, so if you like these videos and think your friends will too, sharing it with them means a lot. Want more Dude You Haven't Played This Game? Check out the videos enclosed below. You can click on the left hand side or the right hand side for a totally different but totally awesome review. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Dude You Haven't Played This Game. Wow, holy sh**, f**k that level, f**k that level.